Thank you very much, John and Paul, for inviting me to be with you today. And um, particularly here in Crow Park, I think the scene recently of some of the great examples, I think, of human endeavor on this island uh, over the last month or so. Uh, I, I don't know if our international visitors have managed to see any of the, the exploits on the field uh, to our right here, but it's been an incredible season. And it's really nice to be here in Crow Park, I have to say. Um, just in relation to our context, uh, this is uh, maybe mainly for our international visitors in a way, we all know this. We have a very challenging context in which we're trying to change the culture of how we care for our patients and really f maintain a major focus on quality and safety and not just on cost and workforce because that's been historically our focus. So financially, we, know, we all know we're extremely challenged. We've taken vast sums of money out of our healthcare service. We've taken vast numbers of staff out of our healthcare service. And this leaves those who remain in a quite stressed environment, I would say. We have a lot of, a lot of change, structural change, new, new hospital networks, uh, multiple policy initiatives. Um, and I, I think a major, and, and th this is the day before the first day of the first NCHD strike for many, many years, uh, which I think in a way is, is a symptom of uh, our, our management staff relationships breaking down very fundamentally. It's ostensibly about uh, long working hours, which we have not properly addressed. And I would certainly acknowledge that. And I used to be involved in the battle against long hours as an NCHD myself back in the 1980s. So it's a little bit sad that the battle continues. But we have a major challenge. Uh, um, we've had a speaker from Australia. Uh, we'd like Australia to stop enticing all our best workers over there because an awful lot of them go there. Uh, Bondi Beach is clearly deemed to be more attractive than the 40 foot here in Dublin, uh, which is uh, understandable. Uh, but we, we, we really have to pay attention to this. Uh, we need to look after our staff a lot better. We need to engage them a lot better, and I'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, we have national standards similar to, to Australia, and I think influenced by the Australian standards in many ways. And we now have a new uh, delivery system. The HSE will be abolished. Um, I know everyone will be very sad about that. And uh, we have HSE directorates focusing on areas of mental health, social care, acute care, primary care, and health and well-being. Uh, this is clearly a risk as well as a potential major step forward. The risk being, of course, that we have disintegrated or fragmented care, uh, care provided in silos. The, the real benefit, potential benefit, is that we actually get some major focus on these areas of, of care. Some of them p potentially historically have been Cinderella areas of focus or, 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 or not really properly focused on at all. So I think it's good that the theme here is that we're learning from each other and learning from other industries. And, and I think we all know which the odd one out is. Uh, safety work has really been pioneered in, in, uh, in, in the other industries and, and, and we're trying to catch up. So, for example, uh, if, if what we achieve in relation to um, hand hygiene was acceptable in, in other industries, and like 99% compliance, as we know, we're nowhere near that. So if in other industries they accept it at a 99% rate, we'd have one major plane crash every three days. And I think uh, Kevin wouldn't uh, be sitting uh, on his hands if that was happening. And, and we'd all, there'd be a, you know, a major uh, outcry. 16,000 items of mail would be lost every hour. And 37,000 ATM errors would occur per hour. So the, the, these are failures that uh, would not be accepted in other industries that we must not accept either. I accept that our, our industry, if you like, healthcare, is, 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 is a very complex one. Uh, it's, it, it's all about humans. But, but all of these industries are run by staff, human beings who have put in systems of briefing and debriefing and, and all kinds of other systems that we need to learn from and, and we need to achieve the same kind of results that they achieve. And if we did, we'd have a very much safer system because I think currently we do not have an acceptably safe system. It's unacceptable. Uh, that we have such consistent rates of harm, particularly measured in our hospitals, but also in primary care. Harm, as I would describe it, would be anything that we feel we would not like to happen to ourselves or to our family. And we have consistent rates of harm. We have uh, w proven evidence-based solutions to avoid healthcare-associated infections in relation to long lines, in relation to uh, ventilation in, in ICU. Uh, evidence-based solutions that are not being implemented systematically across our system. 
We persist to have incidents of wrong side surgery despite clear policy in this area. And anything we look at, any, anything we ever measure or analyze, all we ever find is variation. Variation in practice, variation in prescribing, and all leading to variation in outcomes. Not explained by variations in acuity of patients, but explained by unevidenced variations in what people do. And this is costing us a lot, and it's costing uh, our patients a lot, most importantly. There's a tendency, I think, to blame the system, and particularly when we have a HSE with the word E in it, the executive, it's, it's, it creates an us and them, and it's, it's very easy to blame the HSE or the system or somebody else or them for everything. But I think it's really critical that we move to a situation where we all individually assume responsibility for the quality of what goes on around us. And we recognize that some of the things that we may be prone to ourselves may contribute to a lack of quality or a lack of safety. Things like our own personal ambition. Not something that we should uh, avoid. Personal ambition is critically important, but it can, uh, it can lead us to behave in certain ways that does not put the patient first. Things, particularly in our system, potential conflicts between public and private care, uh, bullying behavior, turf battles between specialties or between hospitals. We all know we have many examples of that. Uh, unhelpful kind of competition between different specialties, lack of respect for each other, uh, etc. There's, there's, there's a whole list of other personal things that, that uh, we, we, we should uh, recognize as being potentially within us and potentially contributing to something that does not improve patient care and rather uh, hinders it. So mindfulness is one of the things that we lose, I think particularly in this kind of stressed environment in which we're working in. Uh, mindfulness is kind of being able to be aware of your situation, take stock and think your way through decisions that you make. When you lose mindfulness, you, you, you operate in, in a knee-jerk knee fashion and uh, uh, in, in a kind of a formulaic fashion and, and, and sometimes you can, uh, you can make serious errors when you, lose, when you lose your own awareness of the situation you're operating in. So we've been promoting various aids to mindfulness, things like the surgical checklist, which is internationally renowned and acknowledged as, as having made a major contribution to surgical safety wherever it's been uh, implemented. And its implementation here, we've audited it, is patchy. It's, it's adopted everywhere, but is it actually followed? Not always. Uh, SBAR, this structured communication process, we're, pr we're promoting that through our hospital system. And, and I think it's something that uh, will, could really change the culture of how we care for our patients. Safety pauses, Maureen Flynn, who works for me, she's a, uh, developed some fantastic materials, uh, one of them on the whole concept of uh, implementing a safety pause. And I, I noted from the Irish College of GPs journal recently that the editor has started to implement the safety pause in his own practice. So it's not something that just has to happen in hospitals. It's a stock take, where are we today? Um, what do we need to be worried about? And what should we be doing to, to manage the risks uh, that, that immediately are identifiable? We're promoting the, the early warning score, obviously, in adult acute care and in maternity care. We've rolled it out to all hospitals. And uh, I think we're probably the first country in the world to have implemented uh, the maternity early warning score across all hospitals. And we'll be auditing and monitoring that in such a way that hopefully we'll be able to develop learning that we share internationally then so as others can learn from our uh, pioneering work in that regard. Uh, bundles are structured uh, approaches to managing out harm. And, and simulation training is increasingly being used in the, in the training of our staff. The voice of the patient is clearly something that my director is responsible for uh, promoting policy in relation to and practice in relation to involving patients. And I think that the voice of the patient is a key driver for quality, uh, largely untapped still. And the voice of frontline staff and, and juniors and trainees and students. Students come into our hospitals either as nurses or physiotherapists or doctors. And I'm not sure we ever ask them what they think. They're a fresh pair of eyes. They haven't been acculturated. They haven't been kind of worn down. Uh, they, they have their own view and it's potentially a very rich source of, of analysis as to whether the way we do things, the way we do things around here, if you like, is really a good way of doing things. So we just run something about the way we do things around here now as, as a video clip to see uh, if you recognize this behavior where you work.
recognize the song, I'm sure. A group of scientists placed five monkeys in a cage and in the middle, a ladder with bananas on the top. Every time a monkey went up the ladder, the scientists soaked the rest of the monkeys with cold water. After a while, every time a monkey went up the ladder, the others beat up the one on the ladder. After some time, no monkey dared to go up the ladder regardless of the temptation. Scientists then decided to substitute one of the monkeys. The first thing this new monkey did was to go up the ladder. Immediately, the other monkeys beat him up. After several beatings, the new member learned not to climb the ladder, even though he never knew why. A second monkey was substituted and then the same occurred. The first monkey participated on the beating for the second monkey. A third monkey was changed and the same was repeated, the beating. The fourth was substituted and the beating was repeated. And finally, the fifth monkey was replaced. What was left was a group of five monkeys that even though none had ever received a cold shower, it continued to beat up any monkey who attempted to climb the ladder. If it was possible to ask the monkeys why they would beat up all those who attempted to go up the ladder, I bet you their answer would be, I don't know, that's just how things are done around here. Some things have never changed. That's just the way it is. Thanks very much. So, are we monkeys with bananas? Uh, hopefully not, but in reality, I guess, what, what, what that says to me, and I, it, it demonstrates, I think, that the way we do things around here is very powerful. Uh, it, I've worked in very many different settings. Uh, I worked outside of the system, if you like, advocating for patient groups and uh, working around health inequality. Then I worked, and worked in, in the Department of Health, and I could feel, you, you know, the, the, the culture that prevails there I can feel the culture that prevails in the HSE. Uh, wherever you all work, there is a dominant culture, norms, ways people do things. And I suppose what we're trying to promote is, promote that everybody stops and asks, why are things done this way? And is it the best way of doing things? Uh, I, I, I couldn't better Albert Einstein, I guess, uh, who says you cannot solve a problem using the thinking that got you there. Uh, and, and I think that's something that uh, we, 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 we try to promote. Uh, equally, we, we've been doing a lot of capacity building around quality improvement, very much informed by the work of Ed Edwards Demings, uh, Deming, and uh, he, he talks about the critical importance of data, and our previous speaker was, was talking about you know, kind of the evidence. Do we have evidence for whether regulation has worked? I think what we really need to do is if we're inst instituting change, we need to measure the baseline and measure progress against that baseline, and that's what we're trying to promote through our... Uh, through our, our capacity building exercises. I think what John Kenneth Galbraith says about uh, change is, 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 has got many parallels. He talks about, given a choice between changing and proving that it's not necessary, most people get busy on the proof. Uh, I think we all know that to be the case, and I know that, for example, uh, you could apply that equally to information on uh, quality. If, if, you, if we produce information on quality, people get busy on proving that the, the data is, is poor, poor quality data, so we don't have to deal with a message that maybe care is poor. So I, I, I have personally many experiences of that, and I think that's something that we just need simply to challenge. So systems theory is something that we're trying to, to explain and, and, and uh, uh, promote uh, an understanding of through our, our quality improvement diploma that we've been running uh, in partnership with the College of Physicians. And, and I, I really agree very fundamentally with this statement that uh, after many, many years transforming the car industry in, in, in Japan, uh, Deming comes up with the statement, if I had to reduce my message to just a few words, I'd say it had all to do with reducing variation. I think sometimes we, we cling to the idea that the art of what we do is so important that inevitably outcomes and processes are all going to be different. But in fact, that's just lazy. And the, and, and, and the truth of it is that there are correct ways of doing things. And we need to systematically uh, promote those correct ways of doing things, uh, measure them, and ensure that we iron out the kind of variation that simply harms uh, patients in the end of the day. I think, you know, you don't necessarily have to agree with either side of this slide. But I think it's fair to say that the left-hand side of the slide is, if you like, the dominant model of how we kind of conceptualize healthcare and manage it. 
And the right-hand side is probably much closer to what we're trying to promote through uh, this capacity building work that we're doing with leaders in the healthcare system. But on the left-hand side, we have the idea that quality is expensive, when in fact we know it, it saves money, if, if money is what we're concerned with. Um, the idea that external ins inspection regulation is the only way to improve quality, and I, I'm sure none of us really believe that. Uh, uh, but certainly the, the, the Deming kind of analysis would suggest that, uh, that the quality is best uh, delivered by leadership, by uh, an, a, an attention to how the system creates an environment in which harm and, and lack of quality occurs uh, much more frequently. Uh, that we should, we should be empowering frontline staff, and I'll come back to that very briefly again. Um, he talks about eliminating all standards and targets. Uh, in Ireland, I think it's fair to say, we do not currently measure quality uh, of healthcare. Uh, we, are, we, are, we are beginning to do so. We have a number of measures of quality in our, our performance reports, and that will be rapidly accelerating over the next uh, three to six months, which, which is good. But if that's all that we're doing, and we're measuring uh, various KPIs, we're setting targets, uh, we know from the NHS experience that what that can lead to is tunnel vision, and game playing. So we focus in on the few targets that we have, we ignore everything else, we get hip fracture surgery right, we get uh, tibial surgery wrong, uh, we, we game the targets because we're under pressure to meet them, and, uh, and this, this, this doesn't necessarily improve performance. So while we, we need to measure quality, we need to do so with, a, with an intelligence that understands the potential impact of some of those uh, perverse outcomes of, of targets. Um, and then finally, I think, and I, I, we're in the week where I think Hickwell will be producing the report, their report on Galway. We've already done our report on Galway. And there's been a lot of focus generally around adverse events and sanctions. And I was interested in the, in the earlier discussion about sanctions. This is sanctions against individuals. And there's a, there's a huge pressure now, I think, to, to chop somebody's head off. Uh, and I suppose I would say this because mine could, could be one of the heads that might get chopped off. But I don't believe personally, honestly, that the kind of fear and blame culture is the, is the environment in which we will truly improve care. I don't believe that, and I'm not going to personally contribute to it. So what are we doing then in the directorate uh, to try to, 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 to move on quality? An awful lot of what we do, we get dragged into reactive work, let's be honest. We get dragged into, when things go wrong, uh, fronting up to adverse events, incidents, uh, media demands for uh, an analysis of why things have gone wrong in particular instances. But we do, in between all of those crises, if you like, uh, devote a, a significant amount of energy to try to build capacity uh, across our system on improving quality. And we have this partnership with the College of Physicians, uh, very much influenced by IHI methodologies to, to, to tool up our, our leaders to, uh, to become beacons of quality improvement as they go back into the system. What we have to do now is we have to support them as they go back into the system to create focuses of quality improvement around the system, uh, little teams, uh, and, and, and out of multiple little initiatives, when they all start to coalesce, I think we'll, we'll genuinely uh, improve the quality overall of our care and change the culture of it. We, need, we do need to improve the measurement and accountability for quality, notwithstanding Deming's view of that. Uh, we're, we're, we're developing uh, clinical governance tools to support uh, leadership, uh, a model of leadership that's distributive, that respects frontline staff, and that gets out and engages with it. Uh, we're measuring patient experience more uh, systematically. We have a, a, a survey tool, validated survey tool, which we're going to distribute through the system, which can be used in a whole series of ways, but hopefully, ultimately, in real-time measurement of patient experience that will be, uh, as I, I believe, the two main ways of ensuring uh, that we have a good, high-quality system is to measure the staff experience and measure the patient experience. And if they're both coming up with good numbers, uh, I think everything else will follow. We're trialing some of these tools in general practice because we, 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 we are aware and wary of being very hospital-focused, and we're trying to develop more on-the-ground support and presence by getting around and not remaining in our, well, if you can call Stevens an ivory tower, somewhat crumbling, crumbling ivory tower, uh, we need to get out of there. So these are the kind of materials that Maureen Flynn has led the development of. Uh, we've also developed a tool to help uh, really make, I think, uh, the standards, national standards that are developed by HICWA in partnership with ourselves and others, many others, um, 
to really make them real, make them manageable, and, and make them the lever for improvement that they really can be. And that, that's just an example of the workbooks that we've developed, uh, which all look very snazzy, I think. Um, so what about, what is, what, is, what is our directorate's agenda, if you like, for any workplace or for your workplace? Um, I think it is, and we will continue to, to support and, and develop methodologies for doing, making this easier, but enabling and supporting frontline quality improvement and innovation. So the frontline, our, our staff are our greatest resource. We always say that, and then we treat them poorly. And then they emigrate, and, and then we're surprised. So I think we really need to listen to frontline staff. They have a lot of the solutions, and it's not just nurses and doctors. Everybody who's working at the frontline, sometimes the people who really talk to patients are in fact the porters. They, they have a very interesting take on things, I think, in hospitals, and we should be listening to them. We need to support good incident investigation. When things do go wrong, we need to learn and disseminate the learning. And we are, we are, we are uh, su supporting that with, with new and fresh policy in that area in practice. We need, we, need, we need to also provide some leadership to the front line in terms of creating an, an environment in which the, the, the workforce is truly engaged. I, I believe that's, that's the only quality system that we, we will develop. If we, if we don't have a well-engaged frontline workforce, we will not develop a quality system. We need to build capacity of ourselves and others in quality improvement, so we should be engaging with these opportunities that are being developed. We need to support these national standards. We need, to create, we need to continue to promote a leadership model that is truly engaged and out there. Uh, we, we need to ensure that everybody knows what they have to do, that their role is clear. It's very, very, very hard, I think, on people when they're called to account for things, uh, when it has been made clear to them in the first instance they're actually responsible for them. We need to know our own clinical outcomes. We should be engaging with them. Every team meeting that we ever have should have outcome measurement and patient experience and staff safety culture measurement which we're doing across all hospitals as the top of the top first agenda item. And then we can get on to the finance and HR after that. Um, we need meaningful patient involvement. I've, I've worked with patient groups and community groups really all my life, all my career. And uh, I, I couldn't believe more in the power and, and the right of patients to be involved. Uh, to, but we need to allow them to develop their agenda and we need to be receptive to their agenda. We need to give feedback to them, not just some kind of tokenistic involvement, which, which can be the, 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 the approach taken. And we should all have a quality strategy and communicate it. So engaging patients is really, I, I think, one of the two pillars of, of how we're going to change the culture and improve quality. Um, there's various ways that patients can be engaged. Obviously, they can be, can be engaged in their own care, particularly those with a chronic illness. Uh, in primary care, we're promoting that, that the primary care teams engage local communities through their community organizations and structures. And hospitals can develop patient fora and, and wider links also with the local community organizations. But I think it's really important that in all of this, patients are empowered and enabled to create their own space where they develop their own agenda. And they're not just responding to what we think is important or the things we're developing in the area of care that we're consulting them about, but what's their view what do they think we should be doing? And I think that's where it gets really interesting. And this is some of the uh, kind of materials we've developed around, I think a much more balanced feedback. Uh, most satisfaction surveys always come out and nobody ever really believes them because they come out at kind of 98, 99% satisfaction. We'd recommend it to our cousin or our brother or sister or a friend. Uh, and yet we have constant negative commentary in the media about the care that we provide. Uh, so what we ask here is we ask people, and the, these materials are, are, will be more widely available, we're going to invest uh, some scarce funding in, in, in multiplying up the uh, availability of these, but it's, it's asking people about their experience and what they think we could do to improve it. So it's not just asking them to give out, uh, they can give out, it's not, we're not trying to avoid complaints. We also think that, that, that this is an opportunity for people to contribute to solutions rather than just highlighting problems. And then just finally in relation to kind of listening to staff. Um, we, we are promoting this patient safety culture survey. It sounds like a patient survey, but it's actually a survey of the environment in which everybody's working in. So what's it like to work in this setting? Can I raise something if I'm worried about how somebody's been cared for? If I think somebody's done something wrong, am I, am I gonna get hammered if I raise it? So it measures, it's a thermometer and it measures that. Uh, we hope to reinstitute quality improvement awards. We've noticed that every time we, we run this patient safety conference in partnership with um, the Department of Health, we've asked for examples of good practice to be put forward and we tried to profile them at the conference. And it's quite extraordinary what people just go off and do on their own 
and no, no money, no support, no nothing. They just go off and they improve something. And then, they, then we at least encourage them to write it up and try and give it some profile. And we think that, that it's, it's not unreasonable that in a system of our size that we should be able to support some form of, of awards to, to, uh, to, to give further profile and support to the, to the kind of innovation that people just get on and do themselves anyway. David, um, I'm not quite sure how to pronounce his surname, I think it's Musiji or Musij. He's the CEO in Windsor Regional Hospital in Ontario. But I, 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 I talked about him at the re recent uh, Association of Directors of Nursing and Midwifery Conference, and I was ticked off for uh, highlighting what he does when in fact it happens here. And it happens here in the hospice in, uh, uh, in Harold's Cross. The CEO there walks in the shoes of their workers. So in other words, what does he do? He sends out an email. He, he was going to do secret CEO, because I think he'd seen Secret Millionaire, and he thought he'd be secret CEO, and, and, and kind of mooch around the place and try and see what was going on. But uh, he, he was obviously instantly recognizable, so that wasn't really going to work. And he didn't really like the idea anyway. So what he does is he, he put out an email to staff and said, I'd like to go and do your job with you for two hours this you know, next week. And he got really inundated with, uh, with requests or responses and proposals. So he goes out every week and does that. And uh, through that, he has started to, I mean, that has now become one of the top performing hospitals in Canada. And he's developed this genius lab, which the geniuses are the frontline staff who know what's going on and know how to make it better. So I think we can learn from Ontario but my trip to Ontario has had to be cancelled and I'm going to make a trip to Harris Cross instead, <laughs> which is obviously much more attractive anyway. So just to kind of finish, I think that kind of exemplifies what, the kind of thinking that we're trying to stamp out from our health service. Um, and I'd really like to thank you all very much for listening to me. Thank you.